Where is the land of milk and honey? What is the land of milk and honey, man? We're going to be wrapping the taste, man. We're going to be digging on it, man. We just had a wonderful night in the ether. I hope you got to catch all the drop. You know what I mean? It's 4 a.m. in Los Angeles. But we team no sleep, man. And this is some drop that I really wanted to get out. A set at, you know what I mean? Uh, we got a lot coming up. And we got a lot of stuff coming up. So, uh, A-Hop, man. A-Hop to all those that uh, enjoyed the Nipsey Hustle tribute as well, man. Love to Yo Sep to Real and CJ Battle for putting that together, man. And, you know, it's just a, it's, it's an honor, man, to flow in a way that we can express ourselves, man. And just, uh, you know, give our heart bone when necessary, man. So, yo, we just talking about the land of milk and honey. And obviously, we already know what we digging on. You know, America, the promised land, Israel, Egypt, all this being right here in the old world. But I really want to dig on what it means, man, when you talk about milk and honey. You know what I'm saying? We've been hearing this, you know, whether you've been Christians or Muslims, milk and honey, you know, goes back to the uh, Epic of Gilgamesh. I mean, different things we're always digging on. This milk and honey scenario, we're going to dig on it from... A bunch of different angles because everybody got a different a different answer everyone got a different thing man. you know well milk symbolizes this and the honey symbolizes that i guess i just kind of it hit me the other day when we was in the uh you know every monday we read the book american holocaust man oh man definitely make sure you get your alkaline i'm gonna need that we over here in Con Drops Corner, man. Don't, don't trip, man. We just in the corner digging on things. Every Monday in the evening, all right, 9 o'clock Pacific time, we're reading this book. We're in season two reading this book. And we're going to get some of this drop out of this book about the land of milk and honey, man. Um, you know, the more we dig on it, the more we start to really ponder, man, like, what does that mean? Because we kind of brush it off. Okay, that symbolizes the promised land. But what does it mean? You know what I mean? What does it mean? What does it really mean? You know what I mean? Does it? Is it really talking about milk? Is milk an allegory for something else? Is honey an allegory for something else? And that's what we're about to get on, man. Right quick, man. AI to all the sponsors at 432 The Drive Radio. Um, again, this is bigger than a YouTube thing. This is... Having our own secluded alcove, our own place, you know what I'm saying? We got the site, we got the app, we got the flow. And uh, you are, you know, truly valued and appreciated, man. So all y'all that have, uh, you know, decided to, you know what I'm saying, be a wall of protection for Drop Nation, AI for joining the sponsor squad, man. The, the dragon, the angel sponsors, you know, dragons are angels, you know. So we say dragon sponsors, we say seraphim, man, the... The six wing highest order of angels, man. You know what I'm saying? You are, uh, you know, truly valued. Thank you so much to all the sponsors. And just a quick shout out, man. I got to I know, I know you don't do it for this. I know you don't do it for this, but, you know, I want to give some love to Simon Johnson, Robert Brown, man. Love to Con Fresh, Miranda Rosado, Patricia King, Marcia. Jose Hipkins, man. Yo, Seth, what it do, man? Penelope Campbell. Niles Dye. Dara Campbell. Miss D. In the Copper Color Awakening. A Hive. Raymond Zulietta. Nettie Perry, my sister. My brother Dustin Williams. My brother Zion Train. Nicholas Garrett. Marvin White. Yolanda Clue. Ryan Brown. Cal Jones. And our, our newest dragon sponsor on the wall, Marvin. Bell, much a hop to you, the Wada. Thank you very much, and every every single penny of this dragon sponsor flow is being, you know, separated or divided with 18 ways or so. It could be 18, 19 ways. We have about 19 different people that are, you know, dropping. They got their radio shows, you know, what I'm saying throughout the week. So we divide it evenly so that we can all build together whatever we we building. So if you're getting, you know, what I'm saying. You know, a few bucks a month doing this and that. We can put it together in X, Y, and Z. We wanted to do that instead of, you know, doing something separate. We want to make sure that we have an infrastructure to literally be able to, you know what I'm saying, spread the flow, 
you know, spread the milk and honey, you know what I'm saying, to the tribe. So you're helping us do that. And click the link below. And not just the Dragon sponsors. I mean, you're helping in a lot of ways. You know, a lot of you are, you know, supporting the merch, supporting the hoodies, the, all the shirts, you know, hit, hit the drop shop. Love again to... To uh, Darnell Masterson for the wonderful donation, as well as uh, Denise Green, my sister. You know, she remains anonymous, but Ahab Denise. You know, I just want to say Ahab, we truly appreciate you. Um, Sherry Tay Parker, love to Arlene Kamazuli. You know, another great supporter of the drive. David Mack, you know, Lavar Beckham, Mario Davis. You know what I mean? I mean, so much great drop. Love to Zendos. Everybody uh, supporting the Frequency of Learning. You can click on the site as well. Or you can go to FrequencyofLearning.com. And it's a program we have set up for homeschoolers and daycare. Um, you know, learning development centers. So that your child can do their homework and do all that. And have 432 hertz playlist to calm them down and relax them. And help them be in a you know proper, stable you know flow uh, while they learn and they have games and we got, we got games too so we have a program for $9.99 a month that you get your password and you get access to all the games and the, and the playlists and all that so all those that are supporting that for the homeschooler package a hop to you you can click all the links below for that but it's just been a beautiful flow beautiful flow man love love also to sherry underwood for the donation as well and uh yeah man i think we're good man you know what i'm saying we're just flowing and y'all been supporting the uh, Drop Nation heading home. Again, we're bringing that out to the forefront, making sure our emergency pod is straight uh, at all times. You know what I'm saying? So, love to Damian Leslie for the recent donation, Dolores Walls. And we also have an anonymous donation as well. a hot for that. Keep supporting the tribal fund. And let's keep the water flowing, man. Let's keep the fire burning. All right, so, you know, we're just doing some housekeeping, man. Some housekeeping. Now I want to get into it, man. But before we talk about the land of milk and honey, I just need you to activate. Because this painting here was done, they say, in 1440. And it's entitled, The Moors Attacked by Wild Men or Wild Men Attacked the Moors. You got the links below. Pull them up, man. Wild men attack the Moors, man. So, you know, with Moors back then, especially, they're just pretty much talking so called black folk, you know what I mean, from different tribes, whether you Israel, whether you Moab, whether you Ammonite, Jebusite, Canaanite. <coughs> it's a series of scenes left to right wild men attacking Moors in castle, wild men fighting with lion dragon unicorn and wild men carrying food to wild women with two children seated at the foot of rocks stylized trees plants rocks that i right. back it up man all right so wild men attacking the moors or saracens or just black people all right who are living in their castles in the 1400s <laughs> and these wild men are also fighting lions and dragons and unicorns. And how's this? How's this relate to the land of milk and honey? Well, of course, you're talking dragons. I mean, you're talking unicorns. You're talking. Uh, you're talking the copper-colored nagas, the royals, the regals. And it really relates to this Game of Thrones situation, man. I mean, if you ain't dug on Game of Thrones yet, you might want to dig on it, man. They got a lot of drop in there. They got the whites, right? We're talking W-I-G-H-T, which li literally means demon or spirit. And you got these white walkers, and you got this wall keeping them out. Then you got the wildlings, a lot of uh, symbolisms. And it's just pretty much like some some of our folks say, man, thank you all for the great comments as well, man. We're going to start doing comment giveaways as well. You know, actually starting this video, leave a comment, and you know what I mean? All the dopest comments, you know, I'm going to put like in a hat or something and just raffle off a shirt, you know, or a hoodie or a hat, whatever we got in stock, man. So we're going to start doing giveaways 
you know, for every video, man. Every video we drop, we're going to give some away, man. How about that, man? How about that, man? We in the third wave. Let's go. Because I need y'all to clear us out because we got some new drop merch coming in for the summertime. So we're going to give away a lot of shirts, a lot of hats, a lot of hoodies. You know what I mean? Then clear the way for a lot of great things that we're going to bring to support the vibration awareness and the infrastructure. You know, the flow, the framework, you know what I mean? The 432 to drop radio, man. So let go. This is a series of scenes of wild men attacking the Moors in castles and fighting lions, dragons, and unicorns, man. <laughs> Come on, man. Meditate. Activate. <laughs> wild men, huh? So when they say that they released people from literally from caves and Caucasus Mountains and all this stuff, I mean, you see their feet, man. Their feet got, you know, they stare at the feet, man. Stare at the feet, man. I don't know. Hold up, man. Let me move my lamp. Let me move my lamp away a little bit. There you go. Hopefully you can see a little bit. There you go. All right, is that better? Uh, you know, I got my lamp, man, because, you know, it's 4 o'clock in the morning, man. We, we need all the light we can get. But that's just a piece of this, what they call tapestry. Uh, there's a whole, there's a whole, like, wall of this stuff, man. It might be a little hard to see here, but pull up the link so you can see it. All right, so... You got a whole wall of this, so you just got one scene, but you got multiple scenes. And yeah, here you see unicorns. I'm looking for the dragons, you know what I mean? I see them fighting lions. I mean, check this thing out. Okay, there you go. I see the dragon is right in the middle. And you see this dude trying to slay the dragon right in the middle. See that? All right. All right. There you go. There we go. All right, man. So you pull up the link. I just wanted to give you that visual. You know, I mean, it's nothing really. A picture's worth a thousand words. Nothing really to say about it, other than it's giving you a depiction of what wild men look like <laughs> and what the civilized, you know, what I'm saying, men look like. All right, and you're seeing the juxtaposition in this situation. <laughs> Okay, bang, there we go. There we go. Yeah, man. Look at him slaying the dragon, right? Think about it, man. Oh, look, I'm showing it. I'm showing it. Look, man. Look, man. I'm showing this to you so that you can get it through your head bone. That whenever they were fighting the Naga, whenever the wild whites, right, were fighting the civilized royal regal Negro, they also had to fight your dragons. And your lions. <laughs> they had to fight your beasts, man. Your your pets, man. Your, your, your homies. Unicorns, too. They had to fight all this, man, just to get to you. Just to get to you. So what side was the dragon on? That's being slayed in this picture. Whose side was the dragon on? When you see this. You're fighting the wild men. Look at their feet. Look at the claws. Now whose side is the dragons on? I mean, they had to be on the side. They had to pick a side. We're talking angels of the highest order, right? So just get that through your head, bone, man, that you coming back online, you coming back awake, 
is also your dragons coming back awake. It's also, you know what I'm saying, the so the so called beast of the field, they also fight with you, just like Queen Khalifa's kingdom, you know what I'm saying? I mean this is where we're at. So, you know, you have a lot of power here. Alright? So let's bring that power on home. We're just talking about the land of milk and honey. So we don't have to go on and on about, you know what I'm saying, where it is. But we just got to talk about what it is. You know what I'm saying? What is this land of milk and honey? So let's talk about some basics, man. Let's, let's cover some basics. You got all these links. You got a gang of links. It says featured links. Click the links below. Pull up the drop. We're going to go there. We're going to talk milk and honey, man. That's all. We're just talking milk and honey, man. Alkaline. All right. Let's go. So. This link right here, pull it up. It's from UHMC. Let's see what they got to say about milk and honey. I, I just want to hear, you know, different perspectives on this milk and honey, you know, business. Because we don't know. I mean, is it just a paradise with a river of milk and a river of honey, you know, and whatever else? Is this milk symbolizing something else? So let's get different takes on it. So this is by Jonathan Cohen, which we know is Khan. Khan, all right. Y'all know, I mean, you got the drop. Your lips distill nectar, my bride. Honey and milk are under your tongue. Okay, Song of Solomon. Spring is the season that recalls the biblical image of a perfect land so fertile its green hills flow with honey dripping from its hives like liquid gold in the sunlight huh right away we're coming out swinging because i'm just gonna give it away you already see the title you know we're gonna read it out of here but this is the first time i really thought about it in terms of gold and pearl you know, obviously, I know I got other, um, you know, what I'm saying metaphor, you know, however you want to call it. But at the end of the day, we're just talking gold and pearls, possibly. Because when America's being called the land of milk and honey, are they looking for hella milk and hella honey? I mean, how much milk do you need? Some people don't even eat milk, some people are lactose intolerant. How many cows need to be milked for there to be a river of milk? Or is there a land flowing with milk? Whose milk? Got to be somebody's milk. Are we talking cashew milk? We're talking some type of soy product? Like, what, what, what are you talking about? Almond milk? You know, uh, honey. How much honey do you need? How much honey will you use? Some people don't like honey. Love to see Jay battle. He says, nah, man, <laughs> that's the throw-up. That's the regurgitation of the bees. The honey is the throw-up of the bees. I'm not eating honey. So he don't eat honey. You know what I mean? He's been trying to get us off of honey. So what do we mean, land flowing with milk and honey? Are we talking honey? Or are we talking money? But we're not talking Moneta Juno, right? We're not talking, you know, fiat debt, debt bills, you know, whatever. <laughs> debt bonds we're talking gold man and right away they mention what spring is the season that recalls the biblical image of a perfect land so fertile its green hills flow with honey dripping from its hives like liquid gold so it could mean different things i'm not just trying to get you to come to a conclusion here i'm just saying think of it outside the box and what is this you know milk and honey really symbolizing and according to you know one of the sources here they they compare it to pearls and gold milk and honey pearls and gold 
milk and honey, pearls and gold. But we also got a twist on that pearls too, man. So, you know, flowing like liquid gold in the sunlight. A spacious land covered with pink hawthorn, red cyclamen, and white rock rose. There are the flowers of its myriad wild fruits and the warm valley air smelling of their nectar and gushing somehow from the land itself. There are springs of pure milk, white as snow, and bright streams of it flowing through the hills, as if the milk of the eternally vibrant earth mother in her fruitful cycle of multiplication. Okay, okay. <clears throat> so we said whose milk? Mama's milk, huh? That's kind of deep. That's kind of deep. That's what I mean. It could mean, you know, either or or both. I like that, though. I ain't thought about... Have you thought about that? Mama's milk? That's why we're talking about it. This is why we're talking... This is why we're having this conversation right now. That's why we're having this discussion. What is the milk and honey symbolized? I like the fertility thing. I like, I like mama... You know, like mama's breast milk, you know what I mean? But it's the earth, you know. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. And gushing somehow from the land itself, there are springs of pure milk, white as snow, and bright streams of it flowing through the hills, as if the milk of eternally vibrant earth mother in her fruitful cycle of multiplication. It is, according to the Bible, the beauty of all lands, a paradise whose people would lack nothing. Stop. Call the tech. Call the T. Why did they come here? You know, we went through this, man. You, you know this already. You know, we're we moving forward, man. You know this already. You know that Columbus is talking about when he's coming here that he's in Eden, right? He says, Eden... It's connected to this Orinoco River flowing through South America, uh, Virginia, and um, Jamestown, and all that's being called Eden, different things, you know. So we know that if you want to talk about a land that is considered a paradise for people that lack nothing, you're in the right place because when they came here, cities of gold, right? We're going to get back in that, man. Cities of gold. Oh, 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 oh. We're going to get back in the cities of gold, man. Because this is what they found here, man. I'm not making this up. I can't make this. I can't make this shit up, man. I can't make this shit up, man. We're talking about the Andes Mountains. We're talking about Mount Rorema. We're talking about all these cities of gold. So is that the, you know, is that what we're talking about? With a land flowing with milk and honey, flowing with gold, liquid gold, rivers of gold. All this is in the Chronicles of Akakor. All this is connected to the Coronado Expeditions. All this is connected to Estebanico, Esteban de Mor, Azamore. And this is what they're looking for or finding. And love to Freddie B, man. Freddie B hit us, man, with two seasons of Cities of Gold, so... We want to make sure we get back on that, man. All right, let's keep it flowing. Let's keep it flowing. So, beauty of all lands. I'm just going, I'm going, to, go, I'm going to go quickly and just kind of go from link to link. I'm not going to get through all this. But I just want to get to what we need to get to. All right? So, cool. But I like that fertility thing. Keep, you know, let, let's table that. Let's put that to the side, man. We're going to come back to that. So, this curious supernatural image is evoked every year in the spring by celebrations of the exodus time out call the tea call the tea well where's the exodus taking place we know this is the old world we know even even horace butler is breaking down the exodus you know discussing the migration through the yucatan right mexico so when we talk exodus when we talk promised land we talk Israel, all right, Israel, we're talking the old world, right, which is America, 
and that's what we're connecting so we know this is the land of milk and honey literally we also know that it's the land of pearls and gold because what they came here and found these treasures off the Indians were just giving us pearls the Indians are just giving us gold we just gave them you know some trash all right some trinkets some worthless trinkets and they're laughing making fun of us because we had so much abundance of pearls and gold <laughs> we didn't you know it's like hey take some man you know it's all good live a little man you know what i mean they're talking about a paradise whose people would lack nothing all you gotta do is read in this book and it's talking about the pestilence and the genocide but especially talking about europe at that time and the Black Plague, it said that the, uh, as far as the death cycle, they weren't living past, they'll be lucky to live to 30, you know what I'm saying, that's how disease infested Europe was when they found you, they'll be lucky to live to 30, man, that was like, whoa, you're old, man, you're, you're 31, they brought all that disease here, now we got a common cold and they want to vaccinate us, and we're going to get on these vaccines, Cause they create the problem they create the disease and then they want to give you a solution to it out of their laboratory that's only going to lead to more disease so it's a damn uh, vicious cycle in this perpetual servitude but are you a homeborn slave israel yashara are you in perpetual slavery are you a forever slave is you waking up is you seeing clearly man I mean, remember, man, these wild men been invading you for a long time, and what did they bring with them? Pestilence, disease. So, who do you think in this picture was lacking nothing? Our way. We're talking paradise, right? It don't matter if they're in Spain. It don't matter if they're fighting right next to Tacumsa, you know what I'm saying, right in the Carolinas and Tennessee. Our people are our people, man. Who do you think was lacking nothing? So, when you talk paradise, there should only be one image in your head bone. Because only one group of people are in castles and the other are called wild men. So what do you think happened here? What do you think happened here? Look at the picture. <coughs> it appears you got invaded again by wild men. Now, that painting I just showed is from 1440. When do you think this happened? When do you think the Holocaust happened? same damn time when was the papal bull doom diverses 1452 so when the pope is saying subjugate all saracens <laughs> and we know that saracen this would pretty much refer to all of us according to him the pope is saying this 10 years after this painting Now, where, where does that Pope Nicholas V fit in in this picture? Whose side is he on? He also wants your castles. They shut down the Byzantine Empire in 1453 and took their castles. So the Pope is from the perspective of the wild men. And you're the dark Saracen that they're stealing the kingdoms dukedoms principalities you got to put just dig it up papal bull 1452 take their principalities their movable and immovable goods and give them to our successors right now you see clearly let's go because we just talking promised land and the fight has always been about the promised land my people 
But did you know that the fight is also about slaying dragons? Did you know that that's part of the fight too? Free Phineas, man. And free Alfred while you at it, man. Free Phineas, free Alfred. We rocking with the creator. We're talking about the land of milk and honey. Now pull up this Jewish learning, myjewishlearning.com. Because we're only talking about a land flow with milk and honey. One of the best recognized descriptions of the land of Israel. Where is that, right? We're going to talk about it. Fall back. Is a land flowing with milk and honey. So does that describe Israel, the state of Israel set up in 1947? Right, so does that describe America? <laughs> California gold rush, Montezuma's gold, Aztec gold, right? So the honey is the gold, the milk is the pearl. Let's keep going. This description immediately conjures up a picture of a rich, fertile, and desirable land. Was Europe or that Asia over there a rich, fertile, desirable land? If it was, they just would have stayed over there. <laughs> Since they had nothing, they had to come over here. They had to come over here and find you with gold and sun, man gold and sun they say you got all the sun you got all the gold a rich fertile desirable that's not even debatable if america is rich fertile and desirable it's not even debatable we're gonna get it though we're gonna get it, we're gonna get it. fall back fall back but what do the words actually mean and what environmental implications are alluded to in this expression we started with the interpretation of the Talmud. So let's go to the Talmud and talk milk and honey. The Talmud interprets the words Zabat Halav U Devash. I know I'm speaking Yiddish. All right? Flowing with milk and honey as milk flows from the goats and honey flows from the figs. For a pastoral people this indeed must have been an inviting description of the land the goats were a source of milk as well as meat and were very prolific in biblical times goats were a reflection of wealth so they just really want to stick real hardcore to the milk thing so they're saying goat milk i asked you even from the very top i said what milk we talking about then we got the mind blasting drop about the earth fertility milk you know what i mean mama's milk the earth milk I said, cool, that might be very nutritious. You know what I'm saying? That might be incredible. I could dig that. <laughs> but they're taking that same thing, but they're just going to stick to the goats. And they're going to say, man, goats are great, man. By the way, man, free Alfred, man. Free Alfred, man. Let's go. All right, so then it's going gonna, it's gonna to get into the ban on livestock and, you know, a bunch of stuff about the livestock, man. All right. All right, so let me get this piece right here. Just skip to the bottom. It says, this leads to the examination of one additional interpretation of Rabbi Samson Raphael Hirsch in his commentary on the expression, a land flowing with milk and honey. Instead of focusing on the meaning of milk and honey, Rabbi Hirsch focuses on the meaning of the word flowing. <laughs> okay, Zavat. He writes, it is very characteristic that the abundance of produce by Zov, Z-O-V, only occurs in reference to Eretz Israel, or the land of Israel. In Tanakh, the word Zov never means flowing. It occurs mainly to describe a human pathological condition and otherwise a flowing forth caused by miraculous power. It does not seem to describe a land that develops in abundance in accordance with its natural fertility, but a land 
that only does this under special conditions. So what does America really look like? What are the special conditions needed to make your land fertile again? What does the scripture say? Keep your commandments. Come home and you will have your land and your land will spring forth. Right? The desolate places will be, you know, replenished, plentiful, bountiful, you know what I mean? So check it out. What's the special circumstances to get your land back and for your land to return for mama to flow, the fertility to flow? All right, let's go, man. I mean, you know, we're just digging off different perspectives of milk and honey. It's not one right answer that we're looking for or one conclusion. We're just digging on it, man. We're just digging on it. Let's go. Miraculous power. So we're talking about a land that only does this, only replenishes under special conditions. This is Palestine is a hard land which can blossom and flourish under the continuous special care of God for it from one year to the other. Look, man, Arizona, New Mexico, all those dry areas will flourish again. There's so much water under there, man. I think under Arizona is like one of the largest water aqueducts, whatever you want to call it. In Utah, we know we're going to go through that. We're going we're gonna to get a little bit on the forbidden histories of America to talk about this underground, underwater, um, underground water. You know, remember, most sides separates the water from the water. So you got more water underground and above than you really got on the surface. And, uh, this has a lot to do with this migration, what they're calling an exodus. This famine that happened around 900 AD that pushed the Anasazi movement. Anasazi, they say, means enemies of our ancestors. So they didn't call themselves Anasazis. They're being called Anasazi by their enemies in that, in that perspective. You know, the enemies of our ancestors. But who's the enemy of the hijack? It might be you. Because the hijack is the wild man, right? So let's go. You know what I mean? We got um, this migration happening, lining up with the Anasazi, which is really also going to connect to what's called the Ho Ho Kam. How do you spell it? Ho Ka Kam or Ho Ho Kam. We're going to talk about that next because that's really connected back to the Aztec, back to the Anasazi. And again, they got all this water underneath Arizona, New Mexico. So when I think about something replenishing and, 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 and flowing forth, I think about all those dry areas, all the dry areas that became famine, famished, where the tribes had to then leave those areas and then set up shop in Tenochtitlan and other areas closer into Mexico, Moshe, Mexico. But it was always connected to the Moshe, the baby in the bathwater, man. You know what I mean? So... It says, it does not seem to describe a land that develops abundance in accordance with its natural fertility, but a land that only does this under special conditions. Keep your commandments and watch what happens. Watch what happens. Palestine is a hard land which can only blossom and flourish under continuous special care. Well, we know we're talking America when we talk about the land of milk and honey. Let's keep going. This is uh, from gotquestions.org. Why was Israel called the land of milk and honey? And then it's going to get into a couple of scripts, which is great. So uh, pull up this link right here, man. Let's go. Let's keep going. Question. Why was Israel called the land of milk and honey? Repeatedly in the Old Testament, God, Hawah, describes the promised land as a land flowing with milk and honey. Exodus 3 and 8, Numbers 14 and 8, Deuteronomy 31 and 20, Ezekiel 20 and 15. All right, we're going to get Exodus 3 and 8. It says, Hawah says to Moses, I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And 
And this kind of like lays it open, man, when you really dig on it, because this happened already, right? We're not talking futuristic. This is Moses leading the tribes, you know, to the promised land. And then Joshua finishes the job. Now, the land that they inherited under Joshua, was it flowing with milk and honey? <laughs> this is the body bag right here. You know, we're going to keep it going, but it's the body bag right here. I didn't really think about it like that i guess but when you read the script it come out again this is hawa saying to moses i have come down to rescue them from the land from the hand of bondage right egyptians and to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land a land flowing with milk and honey the home of the canaanites hittites amorites parasites hivites jebusites so all these people are all in your land all these giants are on your land. It doesn't mean that it's th that they were there first and all this stuff. It just means that they were currently occupying your land. And you will have to keep going back in so-called history. And you will realize that the land was always encoded and destined for you. So when Hawaii has given you a land, whether someone else is occupying it, even if they were occupying it first, when the creator gives you a land and has destined to be, for you to be on a certain lot and then he appoints the time and, and leads the exodus to charge out for you to get there that's your land by birthright because that land was always encoded to your DNA was always set for you so the body bag is this happened already right Moses did this and we were talking about it now so we can just ask the simple question since it says right here we're going to I'm going to give you a land flowing with milk and honey did those Israelites inherit a land literally flowing with milk and honey So all the talk about goat milk and all this stuff is pretty much body bag because not that the future paradise cannot be mama's milk flowing down rivers that would be dope that would be dope you know <laughs> but Basically, it appears to be an allegory, you know, because Hawaii's already promised the land flowing with milk and honey to Moshe, to, to the tribes, to Joshua. And they didn't inherit a land literally with milk and honey. They inherited a land of pearls and gold, man. They inherited a rich land, right? A wealthy land, a land full of gold, right? So... This seems to be leaning more towards on the on the gold hypothesis of what this milk and honey really symbolizes. Alright, so it says first before the plagues, the land of Egypt supported Israel, and yet the Egyptians quite well, yet God called the new land good and spacious. The Hebrew word translated good meaning pleasant, beautiful, fruitful, economic benefits. So is this, you know, what we're talking about with milk and honey, economic benefits, and does that mean that we're leaning more towards pearls and gold, man? Let's just get it <coughs> out of American Holocaust. And we're going to just dig on a quick paragraph right here now. Yeah. Page 102. Go on our site, just type in American Holocaust, Carameo, Ahop, the homie Carameo, my Aki, man, he uh, dropped a complete PDF, because before we had an incomplete PDF, he made sure we had the complete joint, so don't know if that's the one in the library yet, we got a lot of catching up to do, a lot of drop dropping, love to type battle the record keeper who's done phenomenal to put the records in to the library for us, you can always click on book drop, go to the site, just click on book drop, and you have a lot of books that we haven't even put in the library yet. Just clicking on Book Drop. Uh, Caramel, not the full PDF. So click on Book Drop or you can just type in American Holocaust and you should see the latest PDF on our site in the search engine. And uh, yeah, man, page 102, man. All right. Let's go. By the 1560s and 1570s, European 
militia men were traveling throughout the southeast spreading disease and bloody massacre everywhere they went does it sound like they were anywhere near a land of paradise or were they in hell you know what i'm saying spreading disease so these Europeans were just walking around spreading disease on purpose, man. So when you got to take a vaccine shot for measles and mumps and all this shit, you don't, man, you, this was purposely done. There's a reason why you need a measles vaccine because they walked around spreading disease to poison and weaken you before going to war with you. They were acting friendly while spreading disease everywhere. This is how a hijack operates. No honor, no honor in war. They didn't want to fight the best, strongest version of you. They wanted to weaken you as much as possible by poison. Then take your land quite easily. You know what I'm saying? Let's go. So by the 15 and 16, 1560s and 1570s, European militiamen were traveling throughout the southeast spreading disease and bloody massacre everywhere they went still in the early 1570s even after the series of devastating european diseases had attacked virginia indians for more than half a decade all right six years of just pestilence six years of plague the jesuit john rojo rojo r-o-g-e-l generally regarded as the most reliable of all of the early Spanish commentators on this region, so we better listen up. He wrote of coastal Virginia, quote, There are more people here than in any other lands I have seen so far along the coast explore. So he was fully populated by Nagas, Negroes, right? It seems to me that the natives are more settled than in other regions I have been and Father Rojo previously had lived in densely populated Florida. So it was more populated in Virginia than Florida. 25 years later, when the British colonizing troops, listen up, man. 25 years later, when the British colonizing troops arrived at Jamestown, Virginia, they found, quote, a land that promises more than the land of promises. Twenty-five years later, when the British colonizing troops arrived in Virginia, they said they found, quote, a land, quote, that promises more than the land of promise. Instead of milk, we find pearls. Instead of gold, instead of honey. Instead of milk, we find pearl and gold instead of honey. Pause it. Read it. You see it? All right. Page 102. But by now the people they found were greatly reduced in number from what they had been before the coming of the early Europeans. <laughs> Let's get this part. The signs of the previous invaders calling cards could not be missed for the great disease regions and the native men generally noted in anonymous correspondent full fraught with nudes, botches, and palpable appearances in their foreheads. So this was the, they say, the calling card of the towns that the Europeans had swept through, you know that they had swept through them because everything was diseased. Now think about a virus in, in, in your body. What happens when this virus spreads to this part and that part? You know it by the calling card of the disease left behind in that area, that infected area. And all you got to do is walk through the infected areas in America to know which parts were already invaded by the infection or the virus of the European. Now, this is just big facts. I mean, we, we, we got the, the paintings from the 1440 of what a wild man, the wild man looking like. 
All right, we're not making this stuff up. It's, we're just digging on us, man. We ain't here to. We're just digging on us, man. You know what I mean? We're doing this for us, man. This is tribal flow. This is a tribal flow. It's a tribal classroom, all right? You over here, you could be a fly on the wall, kick back. We ain't trying to go in on nobody. We just trying to keep our flow flowing and keep the fire burning. You know what I mean? And the fire needs oxygen to burn. And these hijacks cut down our trees so that we couldn't have the oxygen to ether up. You ever notice that? You ever think about that, my noggin? A fire needs oxygen. You know what I mean? For the combustion, man. You know what I mean? And if you, if you cut down all our trees and we got no ether, then we can't combust, man. We can't powwow up, man. So, removing our trees was very strategic. Because we need that oxygen for the flame, you know what I'm saying? Let go. But our trees are growing again. Don't, don't you worry. We'll be back. Hey, uh. Now again, they found a land that promises more than the land of promise. Instead of milk, we find pearl and gold instead of honey. And this is a decade earlier, in 1596, an epidemic of measles or possibly bubonic plague had swept through Florida, killing many native people. So measles or bubonic plague, take your, take your pick because they're probably the same damn thing. So when you get your measles shots, you're getting your bubonic plague shot. But who gave it to you? What did they do? Since on previous occasions, on two locales had been, the two locales had been nearly simultaneous recipients of European pestilence. In 1586, for example, Thomas Harriet's English troops left disease and death throughout Virginia at the same time that Francis Drake had loosened some quote very foul and frightful diseases among the Indians at St. Augustine in Florida so he loosened the very frightful and very foul diseases man he's walking around loosening his magic loosening the spells loosening the plague at the same time you got Thomas Harriet's English troops doing the same damn thing so they got the straight they got the same battle tactic whether you're talking about the English troops or the British troops what does it say the English troops or you're talking about Francis Drake and them all right whatever they are so whatever they all have the same strategy poison 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 so one of them is walking around hijacking Virginia the others walking around hijacking the indigenous Naga in Florida by just spreading disease all throughout Florida and Virginia why why walk into Eden why walk into paradise and just poison everything up because they know they can take it they're immune if they if they live through all that plague in Europe they're damn near immune to this stuff by now so they sent the ones that were already damn near immune to it. And then they're the ones that's heavily infected as well. You know, um, you know what I'm saying? You know, they have the immunity so that they're not dying, but they still got the virus, you know what I'm saying? It's like having uh what they say, the HIV thing, like if you got the full blown situation or you can still carry the trait. They were carrying the trait, but they weren't sick, you know what I'm saying? But they were sick though. As sick as can be. But it wasn't just by contact. They're literally doing what? Loosening frightful diseases. Very foul and frightful diseases. At the same damn time. And in 1564, a six-year siege of disease and starvation began that reduced Virginia's population drastically. At the same time that, the, that a devastating plague of some sort was killing large numbers of Floridans, Temuscoan people. A plague of some sort. Bubonic plagues, Black Death, 
is what Europe brought. So when you saw that painting of wild men, this is what we're talking about. It wasn't just about the fight. It was about the disease that they were spreading. Whether they got killed or not, they still succeeded in spreading the filth, the disease. You might have won that battle that day and then went home and got sick or brought that to your village and now everybody's sick. And that was like sending a, a nuclear submarine, a biological chemical warfare. They didn't care if they, these people, you know what, man? That's what makes sense when I be reading this stuff. And it's like sometimes it's like Cortez had 600 men. <coughs> Talking 600 men against hundreds of thousands or millions of people. 600 men armed with biological chemical war. It only takes a few to spread. So they weren't really trying to fight. They were just trying to spread, you know, their 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 nuclear biological submarine by landing on your shores. And that's all it took was to poison you up. But even then it wasn't enough. They just had to go crazy with this stuff and keep loosening these agents, these viruses. And just a quick recap. We got this, you know, a while back. But just so you know what they're walking into, so, you know, drop ain't crazy. When we talk promised land. Let's get it from page four. We're talking Hernando Cortez and Bernal Diaz. Let's go. So it says, wrote Cortez's famous companion chronicler Bernal Diaz del Castillo of their visit to one of the provincial cities as the confluence of Lake Chalco and Lake Chicamilco, something like that. Now listen to their description. Listen to the Spaniards' description when they're walking into Mexico for the first time. When we entered the city of Itzpapalapa, the appearance of the palaces, because I want you to know what kind of pristine and clean environment the virus walked into. So we have proof and evidence from the virus's mouth that they walked into a pristine environment. Because that's what a virus does. That's what they want to do. That's what they're programmed to do. They go into pristine environments in your body and poison and infest and infect, right? So when we entered the city of Itzpalapa, the appearance of the palaces in which they house us, the palaces... When you talk to Tartary and all these buildings and palaces, go look at the Montezuma painting again. You're going to see the palaces in the background, all right? How spacious and well-built they were of beautiful stonework, cedar wood, and the wood of other sweet-scented trees. Sounds biblical, cedar wood. Let's go. With great rooms and courts, wonderful to behold, covered with awnings of cotton cloth. When we had looked well at all of this we went to the orchid and garden the crazy thing is these people are marching up for war as they're admiring the beauty of your environment your clean pure promised land man milk and honey man let's go you know they came for the gold they came for the honey right when we looked at all this man we went to the orchid and garden which was such a wonderful thing to see and walk in that I was never tired of looking at the diversity of the trees and noting the scent which each one had. This is Bernal Diaz, all right? And the path full of roses and flowers and the native fruit trees and native roses and the pond of fresh water. There was another thing to observe that great canoes were able to pass into the garden from the lake through an opening that had been made so that there was no need for the occupants to land. They just rode up through the city in the canoe. Paradise, right? Milk and honey, right? And all was cemented and very splendid with many kinds of stone monuments with pictures on them, which gave much to think about. 
than the birds of many kinds and breeds which came into the pond. I say again that I stood looking at it and thought that never, listen up, this is what the hijack, this is what the fested disease plague is thinking about your environment. I say again that I stood looking at it and thought that never in the world would there be discovered lands such as these. So don't give me shit about Asia over there or anything in Africa over there because they didn't discover nothing like when they found a new world, a promised land, milk and honey. Impressive as its tapalapa, its tapalapa was, the Spanish were seeking the heart of the great empire, so they passed on. They wanted the heart bone, man. They wanted the spiral. In addition to the cities that surrounded the Lake of the Moon, other towns were like Lake Tenochtitlan, built on smaller islands within it. As they near, as they neared the area that would take them to Tenochtitlan, Caramel says it's perfectly made. She not titling, you know what I mean? You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Bernal Diaz wrote, When we saw so many cities and villages built in the water, cities and villages built in the water. We're talking Mexico, we're talking Peru, we're talking America. When we saw these cities built in the water and other great towns built on dry land, that straight and level causeway going towards Tenochtitlan. We were amazed and said that it was like the enchantments they tell of in the legend of Amadis or Atlantis. They thought they were in the enchantments. They thought they were in the, the magic of Atlantis when they pulled up in Mexico. This book also says that they pulled up in fresh water, fresh water seas. You know what I'm saying? So they weren't pulling up in salt water the aqueduct was built so ingeniously, man. You know what I mean? That they were pulling up in fresh water. What land do you know that you pull up in fresh water, not salt water? We talking milk and honey, huh? We talking, we talking paradise. We talking the Orinoco flow. Remember, Columbus says that the Orinoco River flowing through South America to Venezuela, that goes directly sourced through. Mount Rorema, the tree Rorema, the tree Rorema, the tree of life is also the source of the Amazon River and the Orinoco that Columbus is saying is flowing out of terrestrial paradise. So if Columbus is saying the Orinoco River is flowing from terrestrial paradise and we find that the source of the Orinoco is a magic mighty tree stump called Mount Rorema today, a flat top Mesa mountain near Venezuela. That's what the whole movie Up is about. They also call it the Devil Tree of El Dorado. We talking gold, we talking honey, we talking dragons. We talking cities of gold. We talking tree of life, we talking paradise. We got to get back on paradise. We got to get back on Mount Rorema, man. Tree of life. Now, <laughs> check this out. It says, We were amazed and said that it was like the enchantments they tell us in the legend of Amadis on account of the great towers and temples and buildings rising from the water and all built of masonry and some of our soldiers even asked whether the things that we saw were not a dream they thought they were dreaming this is from Bernal Diaz this is from the conquistadors this is what the hijack the virus saw as a first-hand witness when they met you Managa palaces coming out the water they said the streets were so clean. <laughs> it says the many boulevards and streets of the city were so neat and well swept, despite its multitude of inhabitants, that the first Europeans to visit never tired 
of remarking on the city's clean cleanliness. So the streets were so clean that they never stopped talking about how clean this the cities are here. The fresh water, the pure water. So you know you're in a land of abundance and purity and cleanliness. They said there were even officials in charge of sweeping. In fact, at least 1,000 public workers were employed to maintain the city streets and keep them clean and watered. Milk and honey, man. So when, by the time the virus is coming here in, in Virginia and Florida spreading disease, remember what they saw first. And you tell me what we're dealing with, man. Because we might be dealing with wild men. <laughs> Damn. Meditate, activate. Wow, wow. Let's get a few more links and then we're going to get into a couple of twists in our theories, especially concerning pearls and gold and all that stuff, man. So let's get it right. Let's get it ready, man. Let's get our, you know, I'm ready to, uh, Meditate myself, man. Let's go. Another great link from patheos.com. Pull that one up. What does the land flowing with milk and honey mean or represent in the Bible? Pull it up. Pull it up. The Bible compares the word of Hawa as honey, were the psalmist writes, where the psalmist writes, how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth, Psalms 119, 103. But so also are the decrees of Hawa spoken in Psalms 19. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of honeycomb. So now you have a gold and honey comparison. All right. By them is your servant warned, and keeping them there is a great reward. The psalmist writes that by God's word, he would feed you with the finest of wheat, and with honey from the rock, I would satisfy you. Ezekiel once told, by Hawa, he said, Son of man, feed your belly with this scroll that I give you and fill your stomach with it. Then I ate it, and it was in my mouth as sweet as honey. So in many places, the word of Hawa is spoken as spoken of as honey, which is both sweet and nu nutritious. But what about milk? How is milk referred to in the Bible? The milk of the word, all right? Milk has both good and bad overtones. When used by the word of God, for example, in Hebrews 5 and 12, I, for thou, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. All right, you got all that. So when it comes to milk, they pretty much go all the way, you know, they got to go to the New Testament. They go into Hebrews 5, Corinthians, 1 Peter, you know. It gets a uh, real new testing. Then it says, The land flowing with milk and honey represents in the Bible with particular reference to the Old Testament where it is found. Alright, so let's get skip down a little bit. So, with the promise of milk and honey, the early explorers and later the early American settlers called this land the land of milk and honey all right 
because it was such a productive and prosperous land, just like the promised land in Canaan. Again, because they know that you're talking about prosperity when you talk about milk and honey. You ain't literally talking milk, and you're not literally talking honey. I don't, it doesn't seem so. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Again, you know what I'm saying? Moses, in that, uh, was it Exodus 3? Let's get it back here again. Exodus 3 and 8. I have come down, I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out the land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. So again, did they, did the Israelites come out of the Exodus in Egypt and walk into a land lit, literally flowing with milk, literally flowing with honey? Or are we talking about gold, man? We're talking about wealth. All right. Or we're talking about, you know, mama. You know what I'm saying? It's all good. Let's keep it going. Another link from Soho.net. Is America the promised land or Egypt? All right, so we're kind of getting a little closer here, right? We're getting a little closer. Pull that one up, you know, and read all these through. I'm just going quick. Social location is vital to understanding how people come to their interpretations and appropriations of the Bible and the stories. One of the most popular biblical stories people have historically personalized has been the story of the Exodus. America's earliest European settlers understood America as the promised land they were entering after fleeing Egypt. Now, this first you're like, man, what Egypt is y'all fleeing to come over here and start? You know what I'm saying? Messing with our pristine environment. But they want to compare themselves, you know what I'm saying, as if they're, you know, they're Joshua and they have some birthright here. And, you know, we're all the Canaanites and, you know what I'm saying, they they have a commandment to kill all of us. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's, that's their sick mentality. That's how they're flipping your history. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Man, it's, it's it's sick, man. But you know the devil. You know that's how the devil operates. It's forked, it flips. You know. Since in telling of the story, they they were the new nation of Israel. So these European invaders consider themselves the new, the excellent new tune, right? The the new Israel, the spiritual Israel, right? That's what Christians say. We're spiritual Israel. They were given divine license to commit the genocide of the native peoples, the new Canaanites that were already living there. Man. Of course, the native peoples already living there, they had the language of the biblical stories probably would have identified the European settlers as Babylon or Syria and themselves as Israel. <laughs> oh, 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 see how that just flipped around? Man, it says, had, of course, the native people, right, the, the copper color cons already living there, had they had the language of the biblical stories, probably would have identified the European settlers as Babylon or Syria and themselves as Israel. So the cons would have called themselves Israel. If they had the biblical stories, which we know that this is the old world and, you know, this is our culture we're talking about. So, it's putting it in your face that the people here would call themselves Israel, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and then it goes into, you know, so-called African slaves also often appropriated the Exodus story of their own escaping along the Underground Railroad from the American South to the North or Canada was akin to crossing the Red Sea or Sea of Reeds. Harriet Tubman became a black Moses. But Moses is already black. So you see the funny style writing we have to deal with. But of course, we, we, we hear that Harriet Tubman or Amanata Ross, her real name, Amanata Ross. Yeah, man. Um, 
was also called Moses. You know what I'm saying? So that was a nickname for her. Another exodus. You know what I mean? Southern plantations, the mud pits of Egypt. They understood that God was leading them to safety out of the bondage of slavery, just as God had done in the past. All right, so interesting stuff here, man. You go dig on the rest, I'm sure. I'm sure it got some great stuff, man. Let's go. All right, now we're on the Webster, MerriamWebster.com. We just put in the phrase, land of milk and honey. <laughs> and this is all that comes up. You read it, man. Check it out, Puna. So all that comes up in the Merriam-Webster, since 1828 it says, right? Definition of land of milk and honey, a place where there is plenty of food and money, and life is very easy. So someone is interpreting milk and honey not as literal milk and honey, but as gold, right? Plenty of food and money, right? Something of abundance. When they came here, they said, oh, this must be the milk and the honey. Look at all this abundance. Let's ravish it. Papu boo, doom diverses. Remember that drop. Take all their things because you had an abundance. Just like the painting of the, of the wild men. They're coming for your abundance. You're people of abundance. You're the regal Negro, man. You're the regal Negro. You got the honey. You got the milk. We're about to get on these pearls. We're about to get on these pearls. All right, so that's the Webster def that's the Webster Dictionary. It says many immigrants thought that America was a land of milk and honey. So again, it's a comparison with America and Israel, and we know that we already been digging the long way on it. You know what I'm saying? To come conclusively that we know we're in the Promised Land. Let's uh. Let's get a couple more, then we're going to talk promised land. This is a book called The Christian Treasury, Volume 34. Let's get it bigger. All right, let's get this quickly. A couple paragraphs of this. I know it's small here. So pull it up and read it along with me. Let's go. That was a beautiful country. God called it a land flowing with milk and honey. He said it was a good land, a land of brooks and water and of fountains and depths that spring out of valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley and vines and fig trees and pomegranates. Remember the Hebrew word, the noun Rimon, R-I-M-O-N, is where they're getting Roman. But Ramon means pomegranate. Remember Joshua and Caleb had to get the pomegranates to prove that they were in the promised land. So anything with the pomegranates represents the promised lands or the pomegranata or simply granata as we have on the maps that show granata right here in the four corners of America. Granata or pomegranata or Ramon or Roman. So when this book is talking about the Roman Jewish colonies in America, we know the Roman is the Ramon, is the pomegranate. And these are people of the promised land called the Romani. 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 Which meant that they had rights to this promised land. And they took that and turned it into Roman, some white Roman version, some other iconoclast version. But we, Ramon simply means pomegranate. Roman simply means connection to the promised land. We're about to go there though. So fig trees, pomegranates, a land of oil, olive, and honey, a land wherein they should eat bread without scarceness, right? They had all this abundance. Let's go down a little bit. <laughs> it says, but it is the most beautiful city than any eye has ever seen. Just like an American Holocaust burnout did said. I had to, I had to, my men thought they were in a dream. It was the most beautiful thing they ever seen. 
What does it say? And some of our soldiers even asked, what are the things that we saw were not a dream? Here it says, but it is the most beautiful city that any eye has ever seen, or any ear has ever heard of, or any mind has ever thought of. That means that when you see it, you're going to think you're in a dream, right? You're going to think you're in the enchantments. And that's exactly what, according to Bernal Diaz, they, they thought when they came here and arrived. Right there in Mexico, man. We're talking Tina Titlin, man. Or any mind has ever thought of. It says gold and pearls. Gold and pearls. Gold and pearls. And precious stones are the only materials employed in building of this city. Body bag, Daniel. When we talk promised land. When we talk this 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 beautiful biblical heaven of, of a city we're talking about pearls and gold man we're going to talk about these pearls more gold and pearls and precious stones are the only materials employed in the building of this city earthly houses have those parts of them which only are seen finished off beautifully the foundations and those parts not seen are made of very coarse rough materials but it is a very different different with the house or city so we're talking gold and pearls so i'm just drawing it in closer man one more link and then we're gonna get into the forbidden histories talk about dragon pearls yeah i just gave it away because when we talk pearls <laughs> are we just talking regular pearls when we know they're slaying your dragon we might be talking dragon pearls and we're talking dragon pearls, oh boy. We're talking power and lots of it. Let's go. Is it just about the gold or about the pearls? Uh-oh. Because we don't think about them hunting down dragons and, and getting dragon pearls. But the Chinese know all about this stuff. The Chinese, it, it's a very evident thing that every dragon had this pearl, this pearl situation. Was it just Chinese dragons? This is a link called Moses in the Quran. Quran and Islamic exegen exegesis. Exegesis. All right. So we're going to talk Quran. We got into the Talmud. Let's go Quran. Talking about the waters of life. Let's talk about the Holy Land. And let's read this part right here about this. You know, milk and honey scenario, man. Pull up this link. Moses in the Quran. All right. Let's pull that up. Let's read some of that. How we doing? Okay, let's go. All right, so we're talking Garden of Eden, Garden of Eden and the gift of the heavy eyeball or stone, which is supposed to symbolize his insatiable arrogance. This parallels other accounts of figures such as Nimrod and his failure to enter paradise on account of his defecation and human impurity. The exegetical link of Alexander and Du al Karnayan to Moses is also appropriate to this idea. Moses and the Israelites, because of their sin in the wilderness of the wandering, are barred from entering into the holy land and are condemned to wander for 40 years and die in the wilderness you, all right well we know that when they say moses and the israelites we know that that was one generation not you know moses the most high only had them you know clear out one generation in the wilderness so that's when we start dodging the hijacks you know what i'm saying we deal with other sources although the removal of the black spot from the prophet muhammad's heart has commonly been understood in relation to the developing doctrine of the prophet's immunity from error and sin. It is also appears to be an account of the removal of original sin, the various accounts of being barred from paradise and the heart washing of the prophet Muhammad uh, highlight that it is only through grace that humans can gain access to paradise and immortality. Through grace, sounds a lot like Christianity. One with the guy in common. Let's go. We just talking the Pope, man. Let go. All right, all right, all right. So let, let's talk about. Let's get to it, man. 
Let's get to it, man. Let's talk about pearls and stuff. <laughs> so this is a, uh, it says exegesis Q108 indicates that the waters of paradise were given to the prophet Muhammad. Abu Hamid reported on the authority of Jahir, on the authority of Atta, and on the authority of Muzarib, Dahar, on the authority of Umar, concerning the word of God, we gave al Kothar to you. He said, it is a river in paradise, the banks of which are gold. It flows with pearls and gems. Body bag, Daniel. All right, man. So we got it. We got another confirmation in the Quran is milk and honey. Like we said at the top of this uh, flow here, are we just talking pearls and gold? I mean, you know, and we know it can mean other things deeper. It can mean mama's milk and all that too. But as far as the hijacks concerned, when they say milk and honey, it appears that they just want that money. It appears they just want that gold and them pearls. And now we got it from this source connecting the Quran and Moshe and the story of paradise, of course. Dodger on hijack. It is a river in paradise, the banks of which are gold, not honey, gold. And it flows with pearls, not milk, <laughs> pearls. So they're talking about rivers of gold and rivers of pearls and precious stones. Sounds a lot like the San Banyan River, they said it's full of precious stones, right? Right, okay. So the San Banyan River has a lot to do with a river of paradise, right? It's a flowing of pearls and gems. Then you got rivers of gold that's being talked about a lot in the cities of gold, uh, you know, investigation. So you have gold rivers, you got rivers of precious stones. That's your land of milk and honey pearls and gold gems and stones abundance let's keep it going though since the mention of the gold pearls and gems parallels the description of paradise found in other ancient near eastern sources including the epic of gilgamesh and the alexander story so we said that that ties into the epic of Gil gilgamesh other descriptions of the waters of paradise mention that they are as white as milk Comparing the water's color and taste to milk and honey. White as milk, but it's not milk, but it's white as milk. Are we just saying it's the river of stones or pearls? Both the tributes of the food and drink in Eden, the wilderness of wandering, and the holy land. Then it goes into the four rivers. of paradise each flowing with a different liquid milk water honey and wine and other accounts of the night's journey the prophet muhammad encounters the four rivers of paradise and is handed three containers holding milk honey and wine so those are two contradictory stories one is that the rivers are of wine and and uh honey and milk the other is that he's handed containers of wine honey and milk so those are you know again pearls and gold when we talk about when we talk about the land of milk and honey so we mentioned before about the waters man underneath Arizona the waters underneath Utah and again the promised land that Daniel Lowe does a great job breaking down in the forbidden histories of America man fair use fair use fair use in your caboose we just digging on it for teaching and scholarship purposes. But yeah, man, we're talking about paradise, man. We're talking about the promised land. Again, on page 62, pull up this document. It's in the library. We got it before. Pause it. Read it. When we talk Kalelus, we're talking promised land, right? Which is what? The land of milk and honey. Where? America. What do we have? Precious stones and gold. What do they want? They want that honey, which means they want that money. They want that gold. They want them stones, man. 
They want them pearls, man. Let's go for the dismount. Again, it says in the article, it tells us of Kalelus, meaning promised land in one sense, and Kali or Kalix, which is the land of America, man. And then we go into it, you can go into the Tote, Texas, Sylvanus, Theodorus. And again, it's a very important paragraph, and I, I advise you to read the rest of this chapter, man. It's going to give you so much drop. In 775 AD, Nehemiah Theodoric reconquered the American Empire of Kalelus, the Promised Land, when? 775 AD. Where were you? Here. Where was Solomon? Here. Kalelus was ruled by Sylvanus to Texas. Solomon the Builder. Solomon the Builder, man. Solomon the Builder, man. We're going to get a little piece over here, man. That's going to connect this to. We're going to do a, a connection because this book right here is using this book as a source. So we learned about this book. We learn about this book from this book, from looking at the sources from this book. And we did a whole series on this. The author of this book took the whole thing down, said copyright violations, because we are studying and reading his book for criticism, really because we're criticizing, because we ain't talking Romans, white people, Jewish white people. We're talking about the Romani, Hebrew, so-called black, copper color, Indian tribes that are the Hebrews and the research he's doing is really proving you not some hijack and they didn't like it so they took eight or nine of our videos down don't even trip though don't even trip don't even trip <laughs> but that's what we talk about when we get to Kalelus man so so Venus to, to so Venus told Texas becomes the Toltecs their lineage becomes these Israel the thirds and Israel the fourths and Israel the fifths all connected to this Tapu Zin character that is mixed, connected to the mixed Kaoto character. The mixed Kaoto character is really just, you know, connecting to the Moshe character. The Kitsukoto character is really connecting to this Joshua character. And all of this is happening in 1100s, 1200s, 1000s. Right here, we're in the 700s. You put all that together, and then you put the fountain of youth in this thing, and then you start getting the picture and breaking free of the spell, getting out the spell, spell barrier, thought spell barrier, waking up. And that painting, man, uh, Ahab to the bro, he calls himself Thoth Moses or Tut Moses or something, so. Hey man, you know, we, we don't get down with thoughts, but you cool though, man. We, we appreciate that painting, man. We appreciate the painting. But yeah, it says Solomon the Builder, Sylvanus to Texas, the hereditary ruler of the former Hebrew Romani colony. Uh, Kalelus was founded in the first century BC by the Babylonian ex exilarch known as Sylvanus Ogam or Sylvanus Bravo, Solomon II, Babylonian exilarch, not. Nasi of Mara, ruler of Sumer, Sumer set in Britain, a great Hebrew ruler. All right, they say Roman Jewish. No, we're talking Hebrew ruler. Soldier and ancestor of the Swan Knights. You know Solomon had the whole fleet of knights, the whole fleet of swan boats. They called the Swan Knights. Who's the Knight Templar? Let's go. Who's the Knights? Hello, man. Come on, man. Who's the Knights? Who's the Swan Knights? A better question is, <laughs> who is Preston John? Who's this brother right here? Who's this Knight? So, you know, we just talking the Swan Knights, man. So then it says Israel the third went south to the Toltec lands of Mexico and his grandson Makir Amarik Amerika Amarik 
the grandson of Israel the third. Now, Israel the third is very important because even on the Kalelu's artifacts that we're getting out of Arizona, these lead crosses and these other artifacts that pulling out of Arizona, they have these names on them like Jacob, Israel, Albion. We got Albion on maps talking about North America as well. You know, we got the Arnon, the Arnian, Anian situation. We got to dig more on that. Come on, man. I mean, it's all it's all making sense. So piece by piece throughout the years, it's been coming closer and closer together. So Israel the third went south to the Toltec lands of Mexico. His grandson is Americ or Makir. Makir just means the mark, the sign, the covenant, all right? Also known as Mixcoatl of the Toltecs. <coughs> and he was the grandfather of Tapuzin, who was called Israel the Seventh, priest of Kitsakoltu. <laughs> so Kitsakoltu had a priest named Israel the Seventh, who is the grandson of Mixcoatl of the Toltecs. Who is the Israel the third went south to the Toltec lands of Mexico, his grandson Makir, so he's the grandson of Israel the third. I mean you put it together. Then he rejoiced or rejoined with the remnant of the Rodans, who he led east and back to Europe, and some of the Latin Jewish Rodans settled in northwest Spain, right? Now you got this all the Hebrews in Spain situation. Put it all together. I mean, we're going to get into this Rodrigo situation as well. Rhoda, Rhoda, Rodrigo. We talked about the waters, man. We talked about the waters. Underneath Utah. Underneath Arizona. And in the top of this... Uh, I want to say is it in the intro. Let me see. Wow, make a good dismount, man. I'm just flowing, man. I'm flowing with y'all, man. We got a couple of minutes. Let's get it like this. So yeah, let's get it on page, uh, I want to say 30, go to 32, let's try that. Talking you dog. I mean, there's good maps on 37 as well. You're gonna see Granata. You're gonna see Cibola, uh, Cibola, Cibola is Kalelus. Kalelus is Cibola. Cibola they say means promised land as well, or Shimbala. Cibola is Cibola or Shimbala. All this is connected. And that's what these authors are bringing out. Another good part of it here is spelled a little different. Cibola is Cibola. It's the same as Kalelus or Promised Land. 
lot of a lot of drop going down here. Oh, there we go right there. Alright. Now here it says Cibola or Kalelu. So I'll let you know when we talk Kalelu's promised land, you're also talking Cibola. So when you see Cibola on the map, alright, that's talking Kalelu's or promised land. And all that is around that Utah, Arizona situation, alright? New Mexico, Hawaku. Now here it talks about, you know, how these waters started to recede around that 900, you know, time period. And it's going, you know, on, correlating perfectly with what the uh, Hakan Hiramar was breaking down with the Anasazi migration. So when these waters start to recede, that's when everybody starts getting on the move, man. That's when all the families start moving. You know what I mean? That's when all the movement starts popping off. And just right quick while this thing is loading up. This is in, uh, again, Kalelu's Roman Jewish colonies in the time of Charlemagne the Great. And it's mentioning the whole, whole calm, H O H O K A M. Although the whole, whole calm, therefore, did not join the Salado. Exodus, we know very little of the Hoho Kam after that exodus. And another twenty another fifty years, no trace remains, man. So just like the Anasazi, you know, supposed to be disappearing, so is this Hoho Kam disappearing. And you got a link that you can click that goes more into the Hoho Kam. It says perhaps we see a replay of the process which in Exorably decimated, decimated the whole whole calm when we trace the intermediate Apache roads of the 18th century in the Tucson area. Then it says the extensive ruling told Texas of the cross inscriptions. All right, so he's on these inscriptions on the artifacts being pulled out of Arizona today would logically be the pre Salado whole whole calm. Monopolis of the Salt and Gila systems. Could the Hoho Kam have spoken Nuat and called themselves Tolteca? So, what we're talking about is these Hoho Kam are the Toltecs, are the Anasazi, right? Are the Aztecs. Here it just says the Toltecs called themselves Toltecas, meaning master craftsmen, and the Aztecs. It says, did the Toltecs call themselves Toltecas, all right? Meaning master craftsman. And the Aztecs means person of Aztlan. Read this paragraph. Pause it, man. So when you talk about Toltecs or Sylvanus Toltecs, it says Solomon the Builder and Toltecs. Toltecas literally means what? Master craftsman. So Master Craftsman, Master Builder, Solomon the Builder, Sylvanus told Texas, Solomon the Builder told Texas, Master Craftsman. And then you got the Aztec, people of Aslan. It's just titles, but same people. And you got this exodus after this famine. And it's all around these ho-ho comms. We're going to get some more of that. We're going to get some more of that. All right. So... Pause and read this paragraph talking about the waters receding at 900 AD. All right, the waters of Utah. This is to better understand how it is possible that this lake existed from the days of crucifixion 2,000 years ago and surviving apparently up into 900 to 1,000 AD. One might want to also read the previous book called Nephi North. All right, so go get all that. He said he suspected for years a remnant of the ancient ocean which once covered the eastern half of Utah. Ancient ocean. So there's a whole ocean underneath the four corners, man. For some time I had played with the idea of the basin area in northeastern Utah retaining a lake having been fed by the underground rivers. Love the tide battle who dropped some great drop on underground rivers. We'll be getting that. 
It is my belief that this lake existed from the days of crucifixion to about 900 AD when another earthquake mentioned by the Roman Jewish colonies and Native American legend occurred causing some source waters to return to the underground subsiding day by day until about 1000 AD and that's when the famine was complete. And when we talk pearls man we just talking pearls man we're talking pearls and and gold man and you can get that link breaking down the dragon pearls and the connection between the dragon pearls the magical jewels the good luck all this associated with these dragons and remember they're slaying your dragons man so you already know they're slaying your dragons it's another great link talking about the pearl symbolism you know these are just more reference tools to keep the theory going man so now that we know in multiple sources including the Quran it's referring to these rivers of pearls or stones and rivers of gold or liquid gold or different types of gold and that's what we're talking about and now these pearls can even go deeper when you talk about the dragons because these dragons have energy frequency vibration first recorded in Chinese historian Pearls have been valued as gemstones for millennia. However, the ancients made little distinction between pearls and actual stones. So river of stones is river of pearls. And they got a lot of different pearl symbolisms that they dig on. And back to the Chinese one. It says, can these two, can these be the two dragons so often depicted facing one another in the air and apparently rushing as if eager to play towards a pearl floating like an iridescent bubble between them? Nothing in the decorative art of China has occasioned more guessing or controversy than this. Two dragons encircling the title, striving for a pearl, striving for a pearl. So you got two dragons, right? On both sides of the war, angels on both sides of the world war fighting over pearls man the dragon pearls man while they're fighting over the gold it's almost like on the celestial level they're fighting over the pearl and dig on it man you got the link so you can dig on these dragon pearls this yin yang male and female elements combined in earth which may which seems pretty close to the biologic biologist view such is the dragon pearl in purely decorative work where the figure of a dragon is writhing in clouds and adapting its Lilith body under the artist's hand to a shape or purpose of a piece of porcelain, man. A bronze article or silken garment, the pearl may be drawn close to the dragon or whatever convenient, man. So we're talking dragon pearls. We're talking the Ho-Ho-Kong. The Ho-Ho-Kong. Talking the ho ho com. We'll get this for the dismount. The ho ho com is the toe tech. Alright, let's go. To the first scientist who asked this question, the ho ho com seemed to appear in Arizona quite suddenly with the ability to build sophisticated irrigation systems. We talked about the beautiful aqueducts, the fresh water that they're coming in, the cities built on water, alright? Early archaeologists proposed that Hohokam culture developed in Mexico and moved into what is now Arizona. And in the 1990s, a major archaeological dig along the Santa Cruz River in Tucson, we're just talking Arizona, resulted in a startling discovery. Archaeologists discovered, identified a culture and people that were ancestors of the Hohokam called the early agricultural period. This early group grew corn, lived in sedimentary villages all around all year round and develop sophisticated irrigation canals man you're talking to Arizona people you're talking the original people we're talking about the four corners you're talking about New Mexico remember all that is Utah there is no Arizona and New Mexico all that is Utah territory all the other stuff is newer man so where is the land of milk and honey you already know where the land of abundance is uh, where's the land of gold and pearls and stones? You already know. You are the Naga. And the Pope said to take your movable and immovable goods. Take your things, man. Take your treasures. 
take your whole foundation and put you in a perpetual cycle of slavery and captivity, man. Ahab again to all the dragon sponsors on the wall, helping us to secure that pearl, man. Secure that honey, secure that milk, man, and keep the water flowing. Allow Hawa, keep on digging, click the links, man, keep surfing the wave. Peace and power.